Hey everybody, welcome to the Linux Cast. I'm your host, Matt. And I'm Tyler. Welcome everybody to the Linux Cast. We talk about Linuxy things. And uh, that's what we're going to do today, of course, as we usually do. So we, we were off last week because I was under the weather last week. Had a stomach bug going around. So, uh, but feeling nice and chipper today. We're going to take some questions from the audience today. That's our plan for the day because uh, I, I was much too lazy to, you know, come up with a topic. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna do that, but before we do, uh, we're gonna do what we always do and talk about our week in open source. So Tyler, uh, what have you been up to the last couple of weeks in open source? Well, a lot. I've been doing a lot of stuff. I've I've improved some of my install for my NixOS configuration, but I am just going. I think I'm just going to go ahead and bite the bullet and just release releasing an ISO using flakes, like a custom ISO to install your flake actually isn't that hard. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and do that because that way it doesn't require internet. It's like all in one package It's uh, easier. So I think I'm going to go ahead and do that here very soon, but I've been working on a lot of stuff like more behind the scenes. I've been helping out. Well, I've, I've been helping out a lot with, helping out uh john alex I'm, I'm also making alex from the linux tube i'm making him a, a website so been doing a lot of stuff with hugo actually right now it's just been a lot of work behind the scenes and that kind of stinks because that means my upload schedule has gotten even worse than it was before which i do not think is an accomplishment so like how is that even possible Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been up to. Also, working a crap ton and getting ready to take some time off. So, hopefully, it'll I'll have more time for videos and stuff here very short. Oh, well, hopefully that'd be cool because your videos are always awesome. So, let's see. My what have I been doing? So, I've started using Plasma Six about a week ago, and I have a video that I'll do on it, like a long term review of it, because I'm gonna use it for about a month or so. Uh, just to say it out loud, this is the most stable plasma plasma experience that I've ever had, like by far. And it's weird. It's it's super weird because Brody did a stream this morning and he had a lot of problems. I've seen like uh, Tech Hut did a video where he said I'm switching, and then like the next day, like I shouldn't have switched. <laughs> so uh, so I I've seen a lot of people who have switched to, to Plasma Six and have had problems, but for me, it's been phenomenally stable. I, there are a few bugs here and there for whatever reason. If I, I right now I have Steam minimized to tray, right? And if I go to the Steam icon and click on it, Wayland crashes and just has to restart for whatever reason. The bar goes away, the wallpaper, everything. But unlike it used to be, like it used to be, if if the compositor cl crashed, you had to like reboot in order to get around <laughs> to get come back. This just pops right back up. It works very well. That's the only real bug that I've come across at all. Like period. And, and that's astonishing because everyone knows who has heard me talk about Plasma. It's always been phenomenally buggy. And I'm on Wayland to boot. Like, and it's Wayland. <laughs> and everybody knows Wayland hates my guts with a passion. So it's been I don't think so. really good. And while I, I'm, I'm missing my window managers and I'll eventually go back, I needed something different and decided I was going to try Plasma for a while. And I am. And it's just been working very, very well. Now, granted, this is an OpenSUSE, so maybe it's just because OpenSUSE is, you know, the best. Always a possibility. <laughs> I would disagree, but it's all right. It's all right. You can disagree. You, you, you're perfectly okay with being wrong, Tyler. You, you, <laughs> just keep, you can just keep being wrong all you want. Uh, OpenSUSE is the best. We don't need to hear don't about worry, your, your fake little distro over there. <laughs> don't worry. We all fall into deletions sometimes. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so yeah, that's that's basically all I've done over the uh, over the course of the last two weeks. Everything else has been real life nonsense. It's just horrible horribleness. But uh, other than that, things are getting back on track. I will say about Plasma is that you don't realize how much you miss a system tray until you come back to having one. I use that thing all the time. I used to I used to swear by not having a system tray in my bar right like i don't need this it takes up space it looks ugly the icons are never the right color all this stuff right but you come back to a desktop environment that has a system tray and you know 
the number of applications that still minimize to tray when they're closed, you don't realize that shit if you don't have a tray. <laughs> so yeah. if you close Discord, it stays open. Like, I didn't even yeah. know that. <laughs> I didn't know, had no clue. If you don't have a system tray, you have no way of knowing unless you're, like, splunking around H-top or something. You know? So, uh, <laughs> That's same so funny. I didn't, I didn't know you were doing that. Like, I could have easily told... There is an option, just so you know, there is an option in Discord to disable that functionality. So you, So it will, if you want to live without a system tray, you can with discord just have it kill itself when you want to but yes i deleted my system tray and tried to live that way for a long time and luckily i knew discord was like that but i also can't remember what application i had the same problem with another application that's pretty popular i can't remember what it was but i assumed it just was quitting no i had like three instances of it running in the background well so my to do my to do application to do is also minimizes the tray. So if you close it, it stays there. Like I had no clue. I mean, not not that big of a deal, but it still was really weird. So if you don't have a system tray, you don't know those things. You'd be surprised at how much shit just carries on living if you if you if you just close it the normal way. So yeah, use a system tray. Uh, so it, it's weird because like GNOME did this whole thing of like three years ago, whatever, we're, we're, we're killing the system tray. We're not going to do system tray icons anymore. And they did this for many reasons, right? But they didn't, because the system tray supposedly is terrible and they, they told applications, don't ever do this. We don't want your, 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 you know, icon there. And we thought, or at least they thought that they're taking away the system tray would kill the system tray icons forever. And in reality, I think more applications use the system tray now than ever before. <laughs> like, like they still use it. So, um, yeah, use a system tray. A anyways, so that's it for this week in FOSS. Let's go ahead and move on to the main event. So what we decided to do is we're going to take questions both from the chat and from the community page where I posted a week ago. So what I thought we could do, Tyler, is that we'll go, we'll both go spelunking for, for questions and then we'll just take turns choosing which one to answer. So uh, why don't you choose a, a question first and we'll answer that one. All right. Well, I saw one question over on the original community post that I think definitely deserves to be asked. Give me one second. I had it on my screen and then I accidentally scrolled. Oh, when are you going to come out as a closeted Linux uh, Mint user? Me? I was thinking of talking yeah. about to me. Yeah, answer, it, yeah, it was definitely directed towards you. The, the answer is never, never. Okay, so first off, if I were to use Linux Mint, I'd definitely be using Linux Mint Debian Edition. Okay, I'm not going to use Ubuntu. You'll never catch me using Ubuntu, ever. I just don't like Ubuntu. I don't want snaps. Now, I know Linux Mint doesn't have snaps, but it's still too Ubuntu for me. So... Linux Mint Debian Edition would be would be it, but I'm not a Linux Mint. I'm not interested in Linux Mint at all. Just I'm just not. My thought on Linux Mint is if I'm going to use LMD, I might as well just use Debian. And the same. I mean, really, I have the same thoughts on Ubuntu all is as well. Is if I'm going to use Ubuntu, I might as well just use Debian. I've become very much interest in just using the base of whatever distro i'm using so like i wouldn't want to use a, an open susa based distro like i wouldn't want to do that i just use open susa i wouldn't want to use a fedora based distro i just want to use fedora a fedora is a little bit different because there are some interesting things out there like george castro is doing a lot of really cool stuff with with bluefin and ublue and stuff so that stuff is more interesting to me but that's about the only one like other than that, offshoots don't interest me nearly as much as they used to. Uh, and obviously, Linux Mint and I don't get, get along ever. Uh, so, never. I actually can tell you the last time I actually used Linux Mint, to be honest with you. Probably probably in a VM for a video, like, two years ago. So, there's the answer to that. So, what, what about you, Tyler? Are you uh, using Linux Mint? Oh, no. No, obviously <laughs> not. I'm in love with Nix OS. Now, I will say, your, your statements and comments sound very reasonable i believe them but also one could make the argument that that is exactly what a closeted linux mint user would say so really what you're saying is that there's no way for me to get out of this without you know showing you my linux mint installation or i could just do this i could just switch to the main cam and you won't be able to see this but everybody else can see that i'm using open tumbleweed it's on 6.7.7 which you 
can't get on Linux Mint without building it yourself. I'm on Plasma 6, which again, you can't get on Linux Mint without probably backporting or something. I don't even know how you'd go about doing that. Uh, and There's even a logo. There's there's a Gecko logo. So this is OpenSUSE, and uh, I'm very proud of that fact because it's, it's good. Man, the joke dies there. Dang. <laughs> <sighs> Could have been a good running rumor for a long time. That that answers Davey No's question, which Linux distro are you daily driving? OpenSUSE. And I have been for 245 days. This is my 245th day. I have 485 days left on the two-year Linux challenge. But if you were to ask me right now, where are you going to go afterwards? I would still say OpenSUSE. Because it's that good. S someone asked a phenomenal question. And I'd, I'd like to see what your answer is. Tips for secure use of the AUR. So my answer to that is don't use the AUR. <laughs> Thank you. That was going to be mine. I wanted to see what you said. Okay. <laughs> like if you want to be 100% secure, don't use the AUR. So uh, that's horrible to say because the AUR is awesome. But if you want to, if you're worried about security and you're worried about any of that, if you don't, especially if you don't know how to read a package, build, at least know how to read a package build if you're going to use the AUR. That way you can at least see what it's installing, what it's building, and all that stuff. Well, I think me and you could probably agree on the fact that, like, the steps to ensure that the package build is actually secure, like, you, you for one, have to go in, read the package build, then go out and like make sure that where it's pulling from is actually proper upstream it's not modified upstream like then okay once all of that's good then you could probably go ahead and install it at that point it's probably just easier to write your own or or just i mean not even bother with the package build just go to the source build it from source you know and really, this isn't an AUR specific problem. It's, it happens on the open build service. It happens in copper. Obviously, it happened for years with PPAs. Just w when someone else controls the repository and they're doing the uploading of the software, you don't have control over the security. That's why you have to have you should have some level of trust in where that software comes from. And if you don't, then it's insecure. And even if you do have trust, that trust can be easily misplaced. By, I mean, by anybody. It doesn't matter how well knowledge you are in Linux or security or whatever. Anybody can find that themselves in a situation where they're using software that's, you know, either old and so it has zero day flaws or it wasn't that long ago that like FlatHub had a application or something like that that had a, a Bitcoin miner in the background. And, and all that stuff was supposedly gone over by the people who run FlatHub, so even they can get fooled. So uh, someone someone asked Tyler, "Have you tried Plasma Six? And no, I have not. I have seen it. Is, it seems to be very much, at least from the people who are popular and like posting about their Plasma Six experience. It seems to be pretty much a fifty-fifty from what I've seen as to whether or not it's." It's really good. Like there's small, like m very minor bugs, but overall it's a very nice experience. And then others being like, this is terrible. It's a complete and utter buggy mess. It doesn't work. Like it's a 50, 50. Uh, Traffitan, Traffitan says, if you don't know how to enable secure boot TPM app, app armor, full disk encryption, or vet package builds, get off at Arch Linux. Well, there goes the vast majority of people who use Arch Linux. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a little bit much uh, for, well, for almost anybody. So, but also, I mean, it's kind of the thing of like, do we really need to be that secure? For most people, you're probably going to be fine using the AUR, probably. Like, it just depends on your, like, your tolerance to risk. I don't know. I, I know that when I ran Arch Linux, I was like that, that I didn't, I just downloaded stuff willy nilly and didn't worry about it. And I know many people who are exactly like that, but I, I think if you're, you've been using Linux for a while and you, you've become more security conscious, you, you, maybe you pay more attention, but probably if you are security conscious, you're just not using the AUR at all. 
you're going to build everything from source. If it, I guess it, the security consciousness really does come in levels. So, I mean, some people just care a little bit, in which case maybe they read the package build. Uh, other people care a lot, in which case they're not using the AUR at all. They're building everything directly from source after re reviewing all you know, 5,000 lines of Rust code or whatever, and, you know, then, then they build it themselves, you know, so there's levels of that stuff, but I don't know. For me personally, I use the OBS all the time on OpenSUSE. I don't go checking for anything, so I'm the most insecure person ever. I just, I just assume that if it builds, it probably is okay. <laughs> so there's definitely like nine different Matt Webbers out there just stealing everything that I own. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's happened. <laughs> okay, so here, here's one from Deviant Dude ninety one. Why did you switch to Linux, and what made you stay in Linux? So we'll we'll answer this for both of us. Uh, just I, I've told this story before, but in 2017, so my first attempt at Linux happened in 2001 ish with SUSE. Somebody handed me a disk. I popped it into my gateway computer, used it for a little while. It was cool, but there was nothing to do on it, and I went back to Windows because I wanted to game. Uh, and at that point, there was still no gaming on Linux, like other than the, the you could play like solitaire or whatever. So that was my first attempt. And in 2017, my buddy Ricky and I decided we wanted to do a podcast on Linux. I still don't know why he he asked me to do it. To be honest with you, he emailed me one day. Ricky and I have been podcasting about movies since 2009 with a with our other friend Vince, and uh, he. At, messaged me one day, asked me if I wanted to do a podcast about Linux. I said, sure, that sounds fun. We started the Linux cast, and then I've been using Linux full-time literally ever since. That's the reason why. So, Tyler, what about you? When and why? Well, I always messed around with Linux. Like, as, a, like as soon as I found out Linux was a thing, when I was, like, pretty young, like, I mean, probably right before puberty, like, I was all, like, I was into checking it out. I loved computers. So like, I just, I also like software. So checking out Ubuntu, like all of the old, like old distros, Hannah Montana Linux, best OS ever. We all know it. We just don't talk about it. You know, trying out all that stuff was always interesting, but it wasn't until like steam was a thing on Linux that that's when I actually switched. Like I could really switch over it then. It wasn't you know, proton level insane good, but there was enough games that were releasing for Linux that it was fine. And I wanted, I held a lot of games on Steam, so I wanted Steam to be part of my actual daily driver. And so once that happened, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people were that way. Like, Linux was a hobby until Steam came over and valve is i mean valve is responsible for pushing a lot of new linux users to the space oh yeah for sure um i, I will say for me gaming really never played and uh, you know uh, any real factor in whether or not i switched to linux because i wasn't a, a pc gamer when i switched over i was more of a console gamer and even then gamer i mean I, i've talked about the sealed copy of arkham city on my shelf so that's how much of a gamer i've ever <laughs> ever been so for me i could use any os really to be honest with you there's there's like everyone talks about the limitations you you kind of go through it when you're switching to a different operating system for me none of it's really mattered because there's n there's not a specific piece of software on any operating system that i can't figure out an alternative for because my workflow even back then was mostly browser based like i started working at my current job and god damn was it 2016 already i've been i've been there for a long time um but anyways the, I, I i've been there and everything there has always been google docs so i just used everything in the browser now there are other things obviously that i do that I want to be able to do with a native client. So things like record videos, I can do that with OBS. That's available cross platform. I, same thing with recording audio. Audacity is there. You know, the the I think the biggest piece of so software that I've discovered that I have a hard time with on Linux is email clients because all the email clients on Linux are terrible. They're all bad. Uh, I use Thunderbird because it's the best of the shit pile, but 
other than that, you know, that's about the only piece of software that I really have. Um, I find that there are other pieces of software on Linux that are just way better. So, like, file managers on Linux are way better. But everybody thinks I'm really weird for having a file manager fetish. So, I guess I'll just stop talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone said, because I think this, is, uh, this isn't this is necessarily a question, but it's something that's probably, a, it's related to what we were talking about and something good to talk about. He said, I think I'll... I think what will finally get me off this godforsaken Windows dual boot is a larger motherboard to fit second GPU for pass through. And I'll go ahead and say this for gaming, that's a terrible idea. Don't do GPU pass through all that stuff because what you're trying to do is play most games that are single player that, that like you can play on Windows and all that stuff work just fine. What you're going to try to do is play games with anti cheat that don't support Linux. Don't do that. Most that of those, don't, don't most of very those like, know you're in a VM? And then, yes. Yeah. You have to do, like, the amount of people that you're going to have to work with, like, you're going to have to be inside of a network of N people, because I'm going to assume you're not a developer and don't, like, want to do all this work to make it, to make it functional. And you have to combat the companies that make easy anti-cheat and do more and more weird things with your virtual machine to try and escape detection from them. And if they detect you, you won't even find out until like two months later when they ban your account in a massive wave of bans. And then like getting past that's a whole nother can of worms. Like to be honest, my recommendation would be instead of trying to do anything that crazy, just switch over to Linux and start trying to do something like Start trying to build a community that tries to work at, and like reach out to companies that use anti cheats that don't support it and the anti cheat companies themselves and petition to get them like Linux support. Well, I mean, I mean, we, we always say that. It. We always say that, but you know, <laughs> people don't want to put that kind of effort. But I think that the solution Trafton mentioned and uh, uh, CCJ mentioned is just a dual boot. If you have to have Windows, just go go into there, use your, use Windows when you pl want to play those, and then come back to Linux for everything else. Well, no, I was talking about in the context of doing a GPU pass through in a virtual machine. Like it's just, it, it, yeah, no, it's just not worth it. You'd be better off to just switch over to Linux and then just try and petition company i mean as hopeless as that is because you know game companies really don't care about linux support so probably ain't gonna go anywhere but you can try and it's and you'd be better off than doing the virtual machines because i know i know a couple people who have been banned for trying to do that so i know muda did uh he does all the virtual machine stuff or at least he did and he, he was always talking about how hard it is to do it sometimes so uh, he and he did the pastor stuff. So let's see. <laughs> that's kind of, that's a little bit too broad there. Uh, someone asked, could you share you some of your favorite Linux tips and tricks? Uh, so when <laughs> and a little broad, but why don't you, you have a good tips or tricks that you can share, Tyler? Yes, absolutely. Hold on, let me uh, go to an empty workspace. Uh, bring me up full screen. Beam me up, Scotty, and I'll show this off. So if you're ever uh, inside of a Linux terminal. Let me zoom in so it's like plenty readable. If you're ever in here and you're typing out some command, actually, hold on, let me type out a real command. Rofi dash show like D run. Okay, so if you've typed it out and like, let's say I misspelled Rofi and I put like trophy or some crap for for the cursor. It if, if I want to go to the end of the line it's control e control e will take my cursor like if i'm over here editing this i fixed it up i want to go to the end of the line control e will take me to the very end of the line now if i want to go back to the beginning like i messed up the trophy part i need to just have rofi control a will take me to the beginning of the line and i can remove that and yeah so those two key bindings it took me I used Linux for ever without knowing those. And those are super, super helpful commands. Save you so much time in the terminal. You're welcome. That Those are good tips. So, so mine is more esoteric. 
If you are having problems on Linux, two things. Well, three things. First, don't immediately distro hop like I did. Try to fix it before you distro hop. You'll be happy eventually that you did because you'll learn more along the way. Second, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, go to a forum. Go to you know Discord or whatever. Third, I guess together there's going to be four four things here. <laughs> I don't know how to count. Uh, when you ask the questions, go to the closest source to the problem if you know what the problem is. So if you're having problems with Plasma, go ask the KDE guys. Don't automatically default to going to like OpenSUSE to ask the KDE problems. A lot of times you can still get help in the OpenSUSE things if you're going to get like you know, if you have problems with KDE, but it's better to go to the source of the problems where the developers actually are living for that specific thing. And the fourth one is don't get turned off by the assholes in the Linux community, because there are a lot of them that are going to come at you with like, read the fucking manual, uh, you're a moron, we don't accept noobs here, whatever the going thing is here. Don't be turned off by them because most they're they're such a small portion of the community. You can go and find somewhere else to ask the question, or just wait for someone that's you know actually a human being to come along and, and answer the question. Because because I I know the number. Of, so I made a video not too long ago about it was titled something along like "Normal people have good reasons to not use Linux." And one of the, other than gaming. In the comment section, the number one thing that people said the reason what turned them away from Linux was the toxic the toxicity of the community, and that just kind of hurts your soul a little bit when you're a member of this community and you know how awesome it is. Like the number of people I've met here that are just freaking amazing it is innumerable. Like you can't I can't count them, but there are just a small number of people who are assholes and give us all a bad name. So try to ignore those people as much as possible. I think, I think probably the best example for like the Linux, like how the Linux community works is like, imagine there's a strip in like LA or like, uh, not LA, like, like Las Vegas. Like, you know, it's just, it's filled with gambling and stuff, but there's this strip of really nice restaurants that you're go like you, you have a desired restaurant that you want to end up with, like your Linux s space, like your Linux community you're trying to find, like around a certain niche that you're interested, all that kind of stuff. You want to get there. You're going down this, like you have reservations for that place, but d the strip that you have to walk down to get there is filled with a whole bunch of people that like try to offer you crap that you don't want or they get really upset that you're not going to like spend your money with them, your time, your money, whatever with them. It's kind of like that. Like you got to shoe off a whole bunch of bad people to end up exactly where you want. And it's not necessarily that they're bad. It's just, you know, some people don't have great social skills and that's not, you know, and every once in a while, you're going to, especially on a smaller project, you'll come along a, a developer who's not as helpful as you think that, you know, maybe they should be. Especially if you're asking a question about their specific problem. Sometimes developers just don't have any interest in providing support. You know, they created a really small bash script or whatever, and they just assume that that thing just works for everyone and they're not, they're not fixing issues. It just works for them or whatever. Maybe they didn't, even, maybe they didn't even intend for other people to use it, but other people are using it and they find themselves in a place where they have to provide support and they don't want to. So they're, they're cranky about it. Yeah. So that happens. Well, I mean, yeah, that, that's, that's so true. Cause I mean, they're, I don't know that everyone understands people skills don't necessarily come with the skills that are required to like build out a great piece of software. Like those two things don't have to go together. So someone can create something that's freaking awesome, super helpful, but not have the people skills to like really help, help out support and work with people and like solve problems and just, you know, work in a team. There, there's a lot of people like that, that like they're really good and like they'll fix problems, but they don't, they don't do well with a team or working with like collaborating with people. So I don't know. You just got to find your space. There's, there's definitely a lot of really, really good people in the Linux community. Like, well, I, really good. I think that the number, like if, if you are having an experience where you're coming across a lot of people who are unhelpful, I think the I mean, some people are just unhelpful by nature, like you said, but other times it's because you're asking for help in the, help in the wrong places. So if you go to like the, the OBS 
uh, form or whatever and ask a question that's really doesn't, you know, they have no way of fix. The OBS guys can't fix Wayland. They just, <laughs> they can't fix it. Wayland's <laughs> not their project. So if you're going there trying to get help with a, a Wayland or a pipe wire issue, just because it's affecting OBS doesn't, you know, that's not the place where you need to go ask that question, right? And most places are just going to, like, for example, I had, I don't even remember what the problem was, but when I first switched to Plasma 6, I had an issue with something going on. So I went to the KDE guys asking for questions. Oh, it, oh, for whatever reason, because of the way that I upgraded to Plasma 6 on OpenSUSE, the audio, the volume icon wasn't in the system tray. So I couldn't change volume easily. So I needed to figure out what package I was missing. But because I didn't think about it, I went to the KDE guys first and asked the question. And very nicely, they said, this sounds more like an OpenSUSE issue and a packaging issue. Go ask the OpenSUSE guy. It was very, very nice. So I did that and went and got the answer. So most of the time, you're going to come across that situation where they don't, you know, have the, the answer there. So you just they just point you in the right direction. Sometimes you get into the Arch Linux forums and ask you a question about your Manjaro install. Do that just once, just for fun. I swear. <laughs> you want to see some people who get triggered, go ask about Manjaro or Arco in the Arch Linux forums. You'll have some fun. <laughs> Actually, that is a really, like, if you ever think, like, ah, man, maybe this this Linux space is not for me. Like, there there really is just, everyone's just bad. Go Go and, like, join, like, you know, a reasonable small Linux community and just hang out there for like five minutes and then make one post, one post about Manjaro on Arch forums. Like, no, immediately you'll see it's just a difference of places and environments. Like, yeah, the Arch forums can already, well, just the Arch community in general can already be kind of a wild place. It's, it's genuinely like the wild, wild west of like software, but yeah, you make a statement like that. That's yeah, you, yeah. You go and get some interesting, interesting feedback. Okay, so just to kind of to dovetail on this. This isn't a question that was asked on, in the in the chat here, but in one of our recent podcasts, actually in the last couple of podcasts, like ever since we did the tier lists, I've had people asking me why we hate Manjaro so much. We don't actually hate Manjaro. We just like trolling the Manjaro folks because it's fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's really the thing. I don't I don't hate Manjaro. I just I yeah, I I I don't even know that I would say I troll them. I I do find them funny because the whole mentality of holding packages back and then they don't actually like address problems in packages and like 2 weeks later you still get a broken package if it hasn't been addressed upstream. Like come on, that's funny. Like the whole idea of protecting you from broken packages and it not working. Come on, that's funny. Yeah, we make fun of the Manjaro people a lot. We, we should say we don't have any problems with the Manjaro people or the people who use Manjaro. It's a fine distribution. Use it if you want. It's just not for us. Uh, so, But yes, we, we did troll the Manjaro people for a couple times in the last couple of videos. Uh, we, should, we should say we're sorry about that. Because really, you just use whatever the hell you want. I don't care what you use. As long as you're not using Nix, I don't care what you use. Nix isn't a real distro, so don't, don't talk to me about that. <laughs> 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 See, actually, there, speaking of that, I think there was a chat of someone say. I think someone asked something. Yeah, NixOS refuses to boot regardless of derivation. What distro should I put on my AMD framework? NixOS, obviously. Like, I, I I know you're talking about it's failing, but that must have been just like a typo. Like, just just install NixOS. You'll be good. I mean, I guess you could install OpenSUSE. Like, it's a decent fallback. But, you know. Wait, hold on. Actually, I do have a question for you. Did you... Have you messed around with using the Nix package manager on OpenSUSE? No. And I won't be doing that. I did I did use it on Debian for a while. So, I've used it as a package manager. Okay. I, I, wanna, I, I wanted to know if it causes issues on... Open SUSE because I I think I've tried it on Debian too. I don't think I tried it on Arch. I know Arch would be like I assume Arch would be fine because I assume like that's probably where a lot of people use it. But I don't know about just on the general like wide Linux ecosystem if it doesn't cause issues other places. Because 
I, I mean, I assume it would be fine, but also, like, I don't know. Yeah, so he, my experience with the Knicks package manager on other distros is very limited. So just keep that in mind as I say the things and but say and just assume that they're 100% wrong. But this is just from my experience. If you're going to use the Knicks package manager on another distro, only use the Knicks package manager for your programs. Just use it completely. Because the way that it works, like on NixOS, when you install packages, everything is put in the same place. Because you're using the Nix package manager, it's all in the Nix store, all the paths are the same, right? Works perfectly fine. On another distro, where the vast majority of packages are being put in the normal Linuxy places, like slash user bin, slash local user bin, places like that, right? In the regular paths. And then you have a situation where you use the Nix package manager on say like Debian they're going to create a Nix store directory in root and put all of your packages all your binaries and stuff there so you you're basically adding another path to your system and that can be an issue when you are a nerd and you're trying to find things also when certain programs look for things in a certain place and it's not in the in the place where it expects it to be it can break stuff uh, i found when i was using it on debian just for the brief amount of time i found a couple examples where some things were looking for things in certain places and it wasn't there because it's in a different path uh, and it's just it's kind of a mess but i would say you'd probably be fine if you weren't mixing and matching so th that's my experience again probably 100 percent wrong because again i didn't lose it for very, very long so all right let's go ahead and see if we can't find ourselves another question here let's um this might be well, i mean go ahead I, I i know someone brought this up in chat i don't i don't know if this was i don't think this was a question directed towards us but what are your thoughts and opinions on you know daily driving or doing a, a long-term review of ubuntu no <laughs> no uh, i did so i when when that thing was first going around when it was just uh, what was it 4m linux what was it um for, something like that it was so, something yeah, else something, something else, else. Like, right it, it's basically the exact same thing only they they changed the name uh, i did a video on it just like every linux youtuber did and it was fun, <laughs> yeah, it was a, and just like every other linux youtuber i was like nope don't use this it looks like a scam uh and this is basically the same thing so i didn't even cover it this time I who I think it was uh, I think it was Muda uh, who who did a video on it recently where he, he said like they're they're charging for Linux and that's not a good thing that's not you can one hundred percent charge for a Linux distro you can do that that's that's not the thing that bothers that bothers anybody about Ubuntu the pro the bigger problem with Ubuntu is that they didn't share any of the source code so it's, it feels and looked proprietary even though it's not. And they've done so much weird things, right? Where some of the features that they proclaim as like the features, they've buried behind the paywall, which pure 100% Microsoft there. I mean, they did a good, they did a fantastic job of emulating Microsoft on actions. So, but still, it's just, yeah, well, but then, you know, like the copyright infringement, like is wild. I mean, like uh, there's, no way anything that they're doing with like the icon just stealing a whole bunch of stuff from microsoft is okay their back ends completely uns it unsecure yeah like dt was just taking a look at their keys i think for their i think it's like their key server or whatever like that's great well and of course they also somebody did like a like a net sniffer thing where like it, it actually takes all of the IP addresses that hit the server and stores it in plain text. So it's not a good distro. Don't use it. If you want to, if you want to create a look and feel similar to windows, find yourself a distro that uses plasma and literally just install a, a windows theme. It'll take five seconds. A lot of those themes will even actually do the theming and, and positioning and everything for you. Just do that. It's, it'll take five seconds. Um, and it will look exactly the same. Also, if, I mean, if you want to run Windows binaries, install Wine. It's not hard. Um, it's literally just sudo app install Wine, Wine Tricks. You're done on, on Ubuntu or Debian, whatever. So, <laughs> let's see here. So this might be a stupid question, but can you can you distro hop without wiping your drive, like maintaining a home user's directory? So the answer to that question is yes. Of course, you can, you can uh, take your home directory with you as long as you want to. Very, very easy to do so. If, if you're going to do that, obviously 
backups are one way, the most obvious way to do it, but also you could do separate partitions, separate sub volumes, whatever distro or uh, file man file system you're using will change that a little bit. So yeah, like my my advice to a lot of people is like if you if you could save up and get another hard drive to put in your system, like if that's an option for you and you don't already have a separate home directory and there's nothing wrong with your computer right now, keep it the way it is. Back up everything. When you get that new new drive, put it in your computer and then just do a reinstall. And at that point, make the new drive your new home partition. That way it's a new drive. So it's not, it, it's less likely to die, you know, as soon you're putting all of your personal data there. And then from that point on, I mean, whenever you want to reinstall a system, you just install the system like regular to the old drive. Or if, you know, if it needs replacing, you can replace your system drive. You install there and just tell it where your home partition is and you'll be fine. Yeah. Now, see, I don't do that because usually when I'm hop, I want to start fresh. Like I don't, I don't want all the cruft. So it just kind of an easy way to just bring clean and just transfer over the stuff that I absolutely know I have to have. Uh, but I know a lot of people, I know some people who have had the same home directory for 20 years. They've never changed it. They just move it along with them. 4NY asks, what is the best, I think this one's going to take a bit, so we're going to have to have a conversation. Uh, what is the best distro logo on NeoFetch? I'm going to scratch out the on Neo, NeoFetch. Let's just talk about the best distro logo. What do you What do you think the best logo of a Linux distro actually is? I'm interested to hear this question. <laughs> that answer. one's hard. Yeah. There's some really um, good ones, man. Like man, yes, sh- there is. So um, we just gave shit, a lot of shit to Manjaro. Manjaro has a really good distro logo. Like their logo is pretty damn good. They that block M. I like that a lot. Um. So, but I don't think I don't, I don't think it's the best, but it's really good. No, I to me it probably it's probably going to be this is odd, but it's probably going to be between um, Gentoo's and Solus's. Oh wow, I Gentoo get- is very unique and with the with the color scheme, it looks very nice, but Solus's like that, that one's very unique. Like the nice sale, like going through, it's, I guess if you were asking what the most unique distro logos were, the, the gen two one would be, but what even is the gen two logo? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> actually, well, actually, wait, yeah. What, what is the Gen is 2 logo? It? What even is the Gen 2 logo? Like, nobody knows what that is. It's like asking what a monad is, you know what I mean? Like, nobody <laughs> knows what that is. Uh, so, I, I I think the Gen 2 logo is pretty cool, especially on, on NeoFetch. On NeoFetch, the Gen 2 logo looks freaking sick. I, I'm ambivalent about this, the Solus one. I, I, don't, I, I have so many thoughts about the distro itself. It kind of plagues the, the logo. So, uh, for my... I would have a really hard time about this, but I think the best, and this is going to piss a lot of people off. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I think the best logo is the Red Hat logo. I mean, that's, fr- like, if, if you see it with, with an actual red fedora logo of, of the Red Hat logo, I think that's the coolest. But it's so close. So, like, obviously, I'd say... My problem with the OpenSUSE logo, despite me being an OpenSUSE fanboy, is first off, they're changing it to something different. So the, the, the new one's not quite as good. And the old one, it, there's so many variations on it. You just, uh, it's it's hard to choose, you know, which one's even official. So I can't choose choose OpenSUSE. Nobody knows what the hell the Ubuntu logo is other than some circles. The Fedora logo is just the fancy F. Honestly, they should have really played into the fedora. They you, an actual hat, but I know what know why they didn't. And then you have like Linux Mint has the stupidest fucking logo ever. Like it just says Linux Mint on it. Like like, like good job <laughs> on creativity there, guys. You guys did a good job. Uh, the De- the Debian logo is freaking awesome. But how does it play? What is the little soupy thing actually mean? Again, how does that play into Debian? Like I'm sure there's a lore there that I just don't know. So, Deb, you know, it's cool, but I don't know how to, to associate it with the word. And then you have, so like the, the LFS logo is actually pretty cool. It's like the, the tux on a, like a puzzle piece. That That's really cool. But I don't, I don't think it's popular enough to, to be the best. I don't know, man. It's a really fucking hard question. I, I, I do really like the Nix OS logo with the flake, but that's not even the most, like I, I wouldn't even... I wouldn't even dare to say that that's the best and most like, you know, impressive logo in Linux. 
I mean, Arch Arch is eh. well. I mean, it's just an, it, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like eh. I mean, it's good. It's not bad, but yeah. it's just eh. all right. So, so let, okay. So let's uh, see of the major distros. Let's see if we can. This is an easier question to answer. Of the major distros, what's the worst one? I'd uh, now this might might surprise some people, but I I'd honestly have to say the Ubuntu logo because even though it's not not horrible what the what is that like i don't what? know for whatever reason i don't know but if this is true or not but this is just the way that i always looked at it is it crop circles i mean <laughs> that's why i always thought it was crop circles i don't know why it's just it looks like crop circles to me like you if you look at like crop circles you see some pictures of crop circles it's always like I mean, circles I, honestly i see it now <laughs> yeah it's like look, look, look looks like crop circles to me for me, the the worst. Uh, <laughs> I always troll these guys. Uh, for me, the worst one is Linux Mint. Uh, I, I don't like that logo at all. Like it's 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 a st- new one is better than the old one. The old one was like that weird like it had like a gigantic. It was like someone took the letters L and M and then just created a really big green stroke around it in in GIMP or whatever, and that's that was the logo. At least now they did. That's have... probably what they did if we been if we're being honest. <laughs> for for the whole, the the new one at least looks a little better, but still, I I I think it's pretty. I mean, no, at least the Ubuntu logo has some creativity because you you can have a discussion over what it is, you know. Same thing with like the Gen two logo. You know, the the Open Suzo logo has a character. The red hat obviously makes you know you know some sense because of the name. The Debian one has some interest. Linux Mint is just the you know the Linux Mint name mark. That's it. Traffic in. All right, we're gonna have to calm this boy down in chat. Okay, what about the naked people holding hands? What wasn't that a thing? Like, didn't Ubuntu have like shirtless people like holding hands on their website for a while? I think I remember this. That, seem, that seems like a yeah. That's that seems like something that I remember as well. It's a it's a circle of friends. <laughs> <laughs> that you know what that is it is supposed to be people that's it i i, I it doesn't look like people it looks like crop circles it, it doesn't yeah it doesn't look like people at all <laughs> all right that that was a pretty good that was a pretty good discussion all right let's see if we can find another one here how can you best use adobe on linux there's not a good way uh you can use some older, uh, older don't use linux or don't use adobe you can use some find some older versions of photoshop and some of the other adobe suite products on like via wine well well correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure adobe's made it in their like licenses where if it you're you can't purchase like even if you were to try to legally go about this i don't even think you can purchase old versions of adobe software and oh, run them no but i mean a lot of people have things that they've bought licenses that they've bought so you can if you want to go into i'm i'm completely missing the name of the, the software for whatever lutris that's the name you can go into lutris and install older versions of Adobe software, if you have a license, you can then plug that in. It's not going to run fantastically well. It's just not. The better solution is either to, A, just dual boot and use Adobe on Windows, which is what they want you to do, or dedicate yourself to, to using the alternatives that are in Linux. So GIMP or Audacity or Inkscape, whatever. Try to try try to switch, switch if that's what you want to do. So, uh, Someone also asked, he's got multiple drives and one has Windows on it. Uh, what's the best way to keep the documents from Windows? Just install Linux and most like full desktop environment Linux distros normally come with a package for NTFS file system support, which is NTFS is the file system that Windows uses, if you're unfamiliar. So you should be able to view those files from Linux, uh, a lot of Linux distros. If your distro doesn't immediately detect the drive or whatever, you can't mount it and view the files in it, then just install the NTFS package and it should work properly. You may have to do a reboot after doing that, like, but I doubt it. Um, so, yeah, just keep that in mind. You don't really need to do anything special to be able to view and back up NTFS packages, or excuse me, Windows file system um files just to go back to the adobe thing for a second so we talked about gpu pass through earlier 
it's not a great idea for gaming. But if you have the ability to do GPU pass through, getting a VM of Mac OS or Windows up running and then using Adobe in the VM will actually work fairly well. Again, won't work won't work for gaming very well because anti cheap. But if you're set on just using Linux and you have the ability to do GPU pass through either with one GPU, which is possible, or you have a second GPU, you could pass it through that way. That'd be a good way of doing it. Obviously, that's going to require some technical expertise that you may or may not have. Google it. There are many people out there who have written fairly good tutorials on how to do GPU threat pass through. It's still going to be technical, but at least you'll have a guide through that. So if you are in a situation where you just want to use Linux and you still have to use Adobe, consider GPU pass through as an option. It's, 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 going to be i i would th say that's better than dual booting but it's not going to be for everyone because you're going to have to have the the operation so steve asks if linux did not exist we've already answered this question once before we'll answer it again if linux did not exist which would you use windows or mac os tyler which would you use just assume bsd is not a thing which would then make mac os not exist but <laughs> just... honestly i'd have to say because because i can't lie about the fact that i do love gaming it have to be windows it, like it would just it, it just have to be now that being said i i don't know if i'd even be using computers nearly as much like i'd probably just keep my games running all the time and just come back to them like suspended or something because i don't do the if i have to use windows as a daily computer like the, you know how often you have to defrag your freaking hard drives I didn't even you know understand. That. Is that still a thing? <laughs> yes. Like, e okay. Even on SSDs, like w NTFS is such a terrible file system. Even on an SSD, it will, it will ruin the SSD faster than pretty much any other file system. Now that doesn't mean running NTFS on a SSD is going to ruin it, but the file system, the way it splits up and like, breaks apart files and puts them just seemingly randomly across the entirety of the blocks on your drive. It like, it just wears and tears your drive pretty much. I, and I mean, I'm not an expert, so it's not like I'm saying like, I know this is like factually true, but I've had enough people tell me and explain to me how, how the NTFS and I've read a bit about it and I don't know, like maybe newer SSDs have a way of just automatically dealing with Windows's BS of how it deals with files. But yeah, it breaks it breaks apart files and throws them across your drives. And so it's it's just factually a worse file system because you have to go through it, defrag it, get those files like closer together on your drive manually because just over time that happens. So for me, the answer to the question would be Mac OS. Obviously, I can. I every once in a while will have to do some service on my mom's laptop. She's the only person in my family that still uses Windows that I have to deal with. And every time I have to, I die a little bit inside. Like Windows is so astonishingly bad. Now, it has some. I I always say that like. Windows has some benefits. Like, obviously, gaming is obviously still a little bit better, at least in terms of multiplayer on Windows. They do a good job, uh, in some cases, of design of their applications. It's very so fucking inconsistent. You really can't say it, though. And, and in, there's some benefits to Windows. But every time I go there, there are just things that piss me off that can't be fixed. So, unless you're using, like, a, a high-dollar version of Windows, you can't turn off updating. Like... You just can't do it. it. It will literally... You could, you could be there writing your magnum opus and in the middle of writing, if you haven't saved, you could lose everything because Windows just decides we're going to restart. I hate that. It drives me nuts. An another thing is that you install basically any piece of software that deals with anything to do with the registry. You have to do a reboot. And the number of... of pieces of software that have to deal with the registry is a lot like a lot of them do that means if you want to install those things you have to do reboot now on, on linux there's a myth that you never have to reboot that's 
mostly a myth. If you do a kernel update, in order to get that new kernel update, you have to reboot. But at least you're in control of it, right? But on Windows, a lot of times you install a piece of software, you have to reboot. Also, I find it slow, hogs resources, all that stuff. So I can't stand Windows. It just drives me bug. Like, if your operating system uses 4 gigabytes on idle, their boot, you're <laughs> doing something <laughs> wrong. Okay? Brother. <laughs> Uh, are you talking about Windows 11? Because Windows 11, for me, idles at 7.6 gigabytes of usage. Yeah, wh whatever. <laughs> Which, to me, that is incredible. That means every service I could possibly need is already running in the background. Yay. Yeah, if that's the situation, I don't like it. You're doing something wrong. So macOS for me is the answer. I don't really care for macOS. I used to be a macOS user. It's fine. I think... Apple does a better job with hardware des of software design than anybody else. I like it a lot better than than uh, Windows in terms of, of UI design. I would I think I would chafe a little bit on the closed nature of customization, but even then, there's ways of working around it. So you can, you can find a window manager if you want to use a window manager on Mac. You can do it; those exist. If you want to do all of your software management through the terminal you can use things like brew on, on on mac os so it works very well now i know there are terminal file uh terminal package managers for windows but i've never used any of them so i don't know how good they are i think mac os would be it plus at least then i could have some really fantastic hardware so like apple apple does hardware better than anyone else at least in my opinion they're just really really good but I've looked into this actually to, to get one of like the M1 or M2 MacBooks just because it's really good. And then I know the first thing that I'm going to do absolutely is put Linux on it. Like uh, Asahi or whatever it is. That's exactly yeah, what I'm doing. It's actually, yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, especially for you because you don't want to do like, you're not going to do that much stuff that needs the GPU anyway. So you're fine. Like you're going to be, it's going to be great. Like I used it. Trust me. It's great. And my sister was extremely scared because while I was using her MacBook, she was like, great, you've ruined it. Because she saw like, you know, she saw me at the command line. She's like, oh, okay, good. So it'll just never have Mac OS on it again. I'm like, no, it's, it's not that hard to install it again. It's fine. Computer's fine. They're, they're really nice laptops. They, they are. I wouldn't disagree with you there. So in a world where you couldn't use Linux, you'd be a Mac OS user. Yeah. Plus, I have an old iMac that I could use. Like, it's here. Um, I have no clue. Uh, the thing came from, it was like 2010, so it was like 14 years old. So I doubt that it would work very well, but it's here. And I have, like, I found the cable for it the other day. So it would be insane. Absolutely insane if you could get Facebook to load on that thing. I don't know. be wild. I, I have a feeling that even with how old it is, I could run a fairly new version of Mac OS. Like, not obviously the most recent, but they cover the... That's another reason why I'd be okay with Mac OS, because th their software stays relevant on older machines for longer than Windows does, at least recently. So, like, Windows will happily kill off your CPU within three or four years. Like, the, if your older CPU doesn't support T, T, TPM, TCPM, whatever it is, uh, like 2.0 or whatever it is, you can't use a certain thing of of, of, of your... You can't use your C, CPU anymore. You have to use Windows 10 or you have to do some weird, really weird hacks. The soft Mac OS software tends to last longer on older machines and eventually it does get left behind, but, you know, you can still use it, like, if you want to. Also, you could... I think you'd be safer using older Mac OS software that's no longer getting updated than you would be if you were using like Windows XP on old hardware because, you know, that's a, a magnet for malware and stuff. Uh, so Davey No asks, thoughts on the Linux Zen kernel? Are there any benefits that are significant or any downsides? So Tyler, you probably wouldn't know this better than I would. Uh, as someone who's ran it, no. I genuinely cannot tell you that there is a difference either way better or worse with a Zen kernel. For me, it works exactly the same as my stable or like, you know, regular kernel did. It it's fine. It, I, I don't see any improvements, but I also don't see any detriments. So it's not wor it it's it's worth giving it a shot to see if it'll help you give you a slight bit of performance somewhere but even if it does i wouldn't expect it to be incredible anyway 
and also Steve, thank you very much for the super chat, man. Uh, needs a lot. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Steve, for the super chat. Um, I was reading one right behind that. So, uh, ten J zero zero says if there is no Linux, we'd use FreeSPD or even Herd. FreeSPD, I'll give you. A lot of people would use FreeSPD or OpenBSD. No one is using GNU Herd. Okay, <laughs> like no one's using GNU Herd. Okay, okay. I'm gonna pull the pull put a call out here. So, if you're listening to this live or you're listening to this, you know, on the edited version, and you use or have used GNU Herd, email me, email to linuxcast.org, and tell me of your experience. I want to know because. Uh, I maintain that there, outside of the developers of GNU Herd, there's no one actually using GNU Herd. And yes, it's actually still being developed. You can go to their website. Should, wait, wait, hold on. Should someone who has used it for a day before, or like three days, for like a week, sh shoot you an email? Actually on hardware, not in a VM. I want to know. Like, sure, if it's only been a couple days, if you got it up and running and actual usable, I want to know. Because I want to I I I know what your experience is, because... I maintain that no, nobody's actually used it for any significant amount of time and actually got it running to do significant work. Also, just so everyone's clear, I'm pretty sure when we were responding to that question, didn't you even say the BSDs are out of the question? Yeah, we said we, said we weren't going to... We just assumed BSDs didn't exist because we, we, we all know that if there was a situation where Linux wasn't actually a thing, we'd, we'd go use BSD. Yeah, everyone, everyone would just move to BSD. Yeah. And we, we, we would basically just make BSD... The new Linux, like that's, exactly. what, that's what we would do. <laughs> like eventually, Steam would take their support over to BSD, and and we'd we'd get everything up and running on BSD, and then eventually someone would take BSD away from us, and then we'd have to go use something different. But we'd, you know, because because if all the Linux guys moved over to BSD, the BSD guys would have to go create something different because they're using BSD because it's not Linux. <laughs> the, their views on Linux are similar to ours to Windows, at least a lot of them. So. Ooh, free BSD six month challenge win. Never, probably never. Yeah, you you just have too many problems with use. I don't. Well, actually, I don't know though. You'd probably be able to find most of your software on free BSD. I probably could, but I'd have pro so. My biggest issue with even attempting to use BSD as a daily driver is nightmares of when Tyler used OpenBSD, and the astonishing lack of or the, the astonishing appearance of Japanese style audio. <laughs> well, I will say, I think free BSD is the one that actually supports, like it supports like most of the like Linux, -y, like audio subsystems while open BSD, because it's like secure, like it, I think it's only SD STDIO or what, whatever it is, SNDIO. But that one, like, pretty much nothing's really built to work with it. So you have to like do a whole bunch of stuff or they just don't work as well with it. So for you, you'd probably have access to pulse audio and you'd be fine. My only thing is free BSD doesn't seem to like, or didn't seem to like my Ryzen five or my Ryzen 5700 G. It did not like that. Well, I think, I think if we're ever in the situation where a whole bunch of people had to go to BSD, the hardware limitations would get solved very fast because more and more developers would go over there and eventually more and more hardware would be supported. Right? And a lot of the reasons why it's so constrained on hardware right now is because they're all very small projects and they're much more interested in getting to work on, like at least some of the BSDs, to work on server hardware because that's where BSD is, you know, BSD is really big. Uh, someone at uh, uh, 10J00 says, Plan 9 is an option. Well, maybe for Tyler, he's... <laughs> <laughs> no, I've hey look, I spent a week on Plant Nine. Plant Nine is not an option. You you pay that man all. enough, he'll do anything. <laughs> well, actually, I was gonna ask you how much so people were saying like talking about Temple OS. Like so like Plan Nine, Temple OS, like those kind of very obscure, like obviously you can't really run them as a daily driver, like really and use the same applications you're using. How much would someone have to pay you? To like again, you can work, do your daily stuff normally, but you have to in your free time for everything in your free time. You have to run something like Plan Nine or a modified version of Temple OS that you know supports the internet. Like for something like that, how much would someone have to pay? Realistically, probably five grand. 
All right, boys, you heard it. Sell your car, okay? <laughs> you don't need a car. <laughs> Uh, Darth asks, would you use a light theme for the next month uh, for the proper amount of money? Yeah, yes, I would. Uh, but uh, other than no. <laughs> I, hate, I, I hate light themes. Brody did a video recently. I think it was Brody who did a video recently. It says, light themes aren't that bad. They used to be really good when they were on Windows. <laughs> like, man, you lost your mind. <laughs> light themes have never been good. Ever. I, I, I really... Okay, so there is one light theme that when I was testing, like, like switching themes with my like little theme switcher script, I was testing switching back and forth and I picked one cause it said light. And when I switched to it, I mean, it was obscenely white, like obscenely. Everything was just in shades of white. And I don't understand how people just do that. Like I got pretty good backlights. I've turned them down a bit. But I've got other lights on me and shit. Like, I can't do that. Like, I, it's too much. My eyes start hurting. Oh, okay. All right. Everyone in the chat's going to be with me. So Tyler's been having problems with lighting recently. He looks pretty good today. But he has problem with lights. We, we all have, we have the solution for his lighting problems. All he has to do is use a light theme. He'll never need another light again. It just We just blast him full in the face with light. Hold on. Hold on. See, you say that right now. I'm going to switch to let's see a uh, cave light sure yeah we'll switch to this light theme enter a password this is going to take a second it's got to rebuild my whole system oh this god there goes our audio <laughs> that kills the audio i'm going to be so mad at you. <laughs> it, it won't it won't i've done it before <laughs> but yeah so i'll switch over to a light theme and this is gonna this is gonna obliterate my eyes all you had to do is go to the white website of some kind <laughs> Well, also, my entire system is about to change to a white thing. So this terminal is going to go white. Like my, my eyes are about to be blinded. But, yeah, we'll see. It's almost there. It's rebuilding all the GTK. Oh, I did. Oh, crap. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't even think about that. My file manager is going to be blindingly white. Uh, uh, right now, I'm just mostly worried about the the audio recording. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it trust me it's gonna be fine i don't trust you as far as i can throw you when it comes to audio recordings man you should know this <laughs> hey look the obs stuff's still going good everything's doing fine All right, well, right well we're waiting for tyler's slow ass non-district rebuild uh <laughs> yes it's not that bright in the file in the file manager it's not just pure white okay All right, well, we we, good. you gotta show us what it looks like oh okay i have you up on uh, screen I'm just, on. we need to see what it oh looks no like. i didn't open up a terminal Oh. All right, brother. <laughs> yeah, he, okay. He got brighter. Okay. He got brighter. That's hilarious. <laughs> oh. That's funny. This oh, is, God. This is it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll keep it up for too long. <laughs> Holy oh, crud. That's awesome. All right, so last question. What do you think is the main thing holding Linux back from being used by everyday people? There's a question that we've we've answered before. I think it would be, could be good to answer again. So what do you think, Tyler? What's holding it back? Really just paid a proprietary software like that's really it i most most people who like i as as long as the question is what's holding people back who would switch otherwise not just like how like why how, how do we get everyone to switch like if it's about the people who would like it i think it really just comes down to the software like they they use adobe products they use x y or z and they need it yeah and so they just can't so mine's an offshoot of that and it's this is absolutely the number one absolutely truth answer there's no other real answers that play a role in this it's gaming it's 100 percent gaming like we, we we toot our own horn about how awesome proton is but i made that video about why people don't switch uh, a couple uh, a few weeks ago and the number one answer was gaming like th there are games that people want to play that they cannot play on linux and that keeps them from switching so i think that that's the number one right answer i think adobe is probably a close second i i i, I do think that fragmentation does play a role in it because like it, even if adobe wanted to do linux what linux distro do they target right how, how do they know which one to target what what package format do they target it's, i mean it's a little easier now that 
you know, flat packs exist. Hi, buddy. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> uh, so I think it's a little easier now that flat packs and snaps exist, but fragmentation does play such a role in making Linux hard to know where to develop your platform, plat, your develop your program for. That that's a big deal. But I think that gaming is the number one answer. I think that is. So all right. So that's that's. Uh, if you asked a question in. Uh, all right, hold on a second. Best DE GNOME versus KDE. The obvious answer there is XFC. I mean, <laughs> that's the, that's the obvious answer. Anyways, that's it for the questions. If we didn't answer your question, we do apologize. We we got we probably lost them in the stream there somewhere. So uh, if you do have questions that you really want to get answered, email us at email at the linuxcast.org. I'll put them in a follow folder. And the next time we do this, we'll have a whole bunch of questions that we can answer there if, if we need to. So email at the linuxcast.org if you have questions to answer or feedback or whatever, send them there. So uh, before we jump out of this episode, we're going to have to do our nuggies of the week. I still despise the name. And you guys make me say it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> assholes. <laughs> Surrounded by assholes. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a time. The best kind, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's not even the good kind. I'm mean, just... <laughs> <laughs> just... <laughs> it's just surrounded by assholes. Anyway, so Tyler, your nuggy of the week. Mine is Waybar, and particularly the CSS of Waybar. I've been messing around. I showed off my desktop a couple of times. I don't really have a good way of showing showing this off big full screened, but if you see it's it'll be really hard to see, I'm pretty sure on the stream, but I've got animated CSS up in my way bar and I really haven't ever done anything like that before. But now that I know I can do that kind of stuff, what's what you can do with theming your bar is kind of wild i'm very very impressed with it i don't think on on the stream you guys could see it because i'm pretty sure like the top bar was cut off but i've got like stripes going through my workspaces and i can do that with other backgrounds and a whole bunch of different cool animated effects so if you can watch tutorials and learn how to do linear like and just different gradient uh, animations with CSS. There's some pretty incredible things you can do with your top bar. Definitely give it a shot. Okay, so mine is one that I've actually used before, so I'm going to kind of cheat. But I, I want I've been playing it more recently is Kingdoms and Castles on Steam. It is like a Minecraft version of 080 kind of it's a much smaller game than 080 so don't, don't expect there to be you know a, a whole bunch of land free thing everybody's like basically on islands or whatever and you're only there's no multiplayer so it's just playing against the ai but it is just a fun little civilization building game with war and diplomacy and trying to keep your citizens happy and trying to make sure you have all the resources that you have to need that you need you know and also trying to build everything in a confined space so that you have enough room for everything it's really cool you know the, the, my biggest issue with it is it's not very big so there's not a lot of land to explore to so eventually eventually if you want to get bigger you have to eventually declare war on the ai which always is fun so you have to train your troops you have to train your archers you have to build your siege machines it's a really fun game and it's easier to get into than something like zero ad or civilization because it is so so much smaller and smaller in scope so it is a very good uh, little like civilization style game and i've been playing the crap out of it and you know it's it's very nice i, I know i've used it before but i've been playing it again they've added some new features they've added some new stuff uh, it, one of the best things about it is they do constantly develop it. So if you're, you know, if you haven't played in a while, you go back to it. There's still some, there's some new stuff there and some new features. So that's, it's a, it's a really, really good game. So, uh, that's my nuggy of the week. So, wow, that is the end of the episode. So I hope everyone had a good time. I know I definitely did. It was, it was a fantastic conversation and lots of very good questions. If you want to get in contact with us, you can do so in any number of, of ways. Uh, the best way to do so is to head on over to the website, which is the linuxcast.org. There you'll find uh, previous episodes all the way back to season one, although I 
think that I'm a couple episodes behind, but I'll get that updated eventually. Uh, you can also find all my previous blog blog, blog posts there. And as is usual, when I get to the, the contact information, I lose the ability to speak. It's just the normal way of doing things. Anyways, you can find Mr. Tyler on the YouTube at youtube.com slash zanyog. Uh, he does do videos every once in a while, though he has been kind of absent the last couple weeks. So uh, go over there, subscribe, and then uh, ping him on every video that he has and say, hey, Tyler, do you remember your YouTube password? Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll find out eventually. Uh, anyways, you can also f uh, head on over to the linuxcast.org slash contact. There you'll find all sorts of of ways to contact us, including our Discord links, uh, Matrix, Mastodon, Odyssey, all sorts of places if you want to get in contact with us, that's the best place to do so. You can also head on over to the shop, which is available at shop.thelinuscast.org if you want to support the, the channel. There you'll find a whole bunch of awesome merch to check out as well. Tyler also has his own store as well, so that link uh, will be somewhere. I don't know where I have it, I have it somewhere, uh, so you can check that out, check that out as well. Thanks for everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube at patreon.com slash LinuxCast. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel just would not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very, very much for your support. If you want to watch this podcast live, we record this live every Saturday at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, you can tune in, get into the chat. We usually interact with the chat quite a bit, so you can head on over there and we'll, we will have a, a good old time live otherwise the, the edited version of the podcast comes out on monday nights both in video and audio form and you can subscribe to that podcast uh anywhere you can get your podcast so things like apple Podcasts and things like that if you are on apple Podcasts, make sure you leave us a review we'd really appreciate it and uh that's it so we'll see you guys next week we had a wonderful time see ya Bye.